Is that a question? <laughs> I wanted you. I thought you were asking for my opinion. You were a I know. The weak link, as they say, yes. But every chain's got to have one. Wow, look at this. Are we able to get a copy of your notes? That's for, a question for, for all three of you. Are we able to get a copy? Well, the, the question. The, the question is, is can, or what's available in the way of, of notes? Well, obviously, I was reading from the text, and of course, I have the text. So for a small fee, <laughs> yeah, uh, I think what probably, probably the easiest thing, well, you probably have my email, yes. but one of the, I'll, what I'll probably do over in the next few weeks is send it to our webmaster, and it will be posted online on our website, we have a documents tab, and it'll probably be there for the downloading. For all three of you. I know. I'm just talking about myself. Okay. Now let me. Uh, yeah. yeah. Here you answer. Yeah, mine is part of a publication, probably, so I don't think I'll be able to put it online. But there is a video. So. Yes. Yeah, I I really hadn't thought about that, but uh, <coughs> I see uh, the editor of our magazine, The Sword, is leaving the room. But possibly, uh, possibly I might uh, publish my text in the sword if the editor wants it, or uh, if, if I don't publish it there. Uh, I may just, uh, I have to polish it up a little bit before I publish it. It wasn't written to be published as such. Uh, <clears throat> but, so I'd have to do some po uh, polish on it. And in which case, uh, if it wasn't published in the sword, I would probably uh, just send it to Edith and let her make it available to those who want it. Mm -hmm. There was a question. Gene, Gene, you have a question? Okay, I've got lots of questions. Do you want to use this? Um, not too much. <laughs> it's better than everything. It's, it's probably better, yeah. I know. Okay, so uh, my question is to Father Stauer, and it just, it, could you talk a little bit more about that idea? I, I find out that you, at the end of your talk, you're tying things into the Trinity, but before that you were talking about things you can't control, and love, and sort of love expand, expanding in sort of circles. Okay. Good, thank you. Yeah, so remember, those were mostly ideas that flowed from passages from uh, Laudato Si. Um, one is he makes the comment that the unity that we are part of, or the communion that we are part of, is ultimately of the Holy Trinity. And uh, personally, I didn't go into this in the paper, but personally I've always found it, what should I say, so I don't know the exact word, awe-inspiring, mysterious, that we, that we Christians do not believe in a supreme being, the kind of, you know, the, 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 the Amway pyramid with, with the boss at the top, you know, the lone person up, you know, God, the alone with the alone, or the unmoved mover sort of thing. We don't believe in that. We believe that God is an eternal communion of persons. And that says a lot about the nature of our world and that communion of that sort is the profoundest truth of existence. And so, so, so Francis was saying, ultimately, when we have this sense, which I think for us Carmelites is grounded in the experience of contemplation, where we are drawn into that communion of the Trinity, even though we may not be conscious of it, that doesn't matter. Consciousness doesn't really matter, ultimately. It's, it's the, the ground of being that matters. And so, you know, when that happens and we, we grow slowly into a sense of greater and greater communion, be it our families, our churches, wherever we experience that, and ultimately with the potentiality of, of embracing creation, where that happens, what is underneath all of that? And what is shaping and forming it is, of course, the Holy Trinity. The tr a better expression is that I like is the triune God. I mean, 
the Trinity is a concept, but God is triune, which is one way, of, a short way of, of trying to describe this. Okay, then the other one had to do with things we can control or not. Again, that was from, that was from uh, Francis, because he was talking about the gratuitousness of love. And he said, because love is gratuitous, we can even love our enemies, because we have no expectation of anything getting, getting anything back. But love is freely given. And so because of its gratuitous nature, uh, which we learn from God himself, of course, or herself, uh, that we can, you know, even love our enemies as we are called to, which is, you know, the, the ultimate margin or the ultimate periphery. And then he said, and then that kind of understanding of love, which we might practice through loving our enemies, uh, leads us to a capacity to love the world around us. I mean, we're out there walking on the campus, and you see these rabbits, and they're very cute and nice, but, and, but they do nothing for us except, you know, you know I, I reached out and grabbed one of them and slid its throat and had it for supper. But, you know, but to, to just sort of admire it in this way is entering into that which is freely given, of which we are a part, and we have no control over it, nor any desire to control it. It's sort of participatory in this way. So the gratuitous of love is that which allows for this kind of communion within creation. Even, you know, and he says, the wind and the rain, we have no control over these. I mean, I remember when I was in high school, we had a, a three-story house. And whenever we'd have a big thunderous storm, I would always go up on the third floor, which is kind of an attic, but yet yeah, an attic you would walk around in. And I'd throw all the windows open and just sit there and experience the power of this storm. And to have that sense of, of the power of nature in its even more aggressive forms. But that you're part of this incredible mystery of this wondrous, beautiful world. And it stirs up in us this sense of, of a gratuitousness of being, of purpose, of love, of vocation, you name it. If, any, if anybody has a question, I'll run the microphone to you. And y'all can keep that microphone. This is a general question. Can you hear me? Yeah, of course. This is a general question addressed to the panel, a general question of a personal nature in which you may wish to respond generally or you may wish to respond personally or you may want to tell me to sit down and be quiet. <laughs> the question very generally is, what has assisted you and helped you deal with change in your journey of love to the Trinity? Did you get it? Yeah, yeah, would you, you want to just repeat that question again? A general question, what has helped you and assisted you deal with change in your journey of love to the Trinity? The easy answer to that is God's grace, <laughs> which always takes the initiative and without which we do nothing. That question to me is a very speculative theological question, but I suspect you do not want a very speculative theological answer, and I suspect you're actually answering, or you're actually asking a more practical, experiential question that's behind this very speculative Trinitarian the uh, theological question. I taught Trini Trinitarian theology for about 30 years. I'm sure you don't want me to get into that. Uh, so, in view of what I just said, would, would you, is there a way you could rephrase that question? What assisted me? Change. Dealing with change. And what has assisted or helped you deal with, deal with change? Um, what has assisted in your you deal with change? change? In your life as a priest, in your life as a contemplative, in your love toward God. So what has assisted me in yes. dealing with change? Yes, yes. That's God's right. initiative, you mentioned. What's been your response to that over time in dealing with change? I'm, I'm sorry if this question... Well, okay, uh, I, can, I can say this, that in my journey, which happens to be very philosophically, theologically influenced. 
philosophy and theology has had a profound effect on me. Uh, among other effects, it's uh, because of the study of philosophy and theology I've done, I've thrown most of the classical philosophy and theology out the window. I've let go of it, the immutable God, the whole God of classical theology. I don't accept. And so that uh, the study of especially contemporary philosophy and biblical theology, good biblical theology, has made me very open to the reality of change, even change in God. So the immutable God, I don't go there. Uh, but also assisting me in dealing with change is in dealing with myself. Because I have had to change. I have changed. I mean, one changes from the time you're five years old till now 77 years old, obviously there are changes going on, and so to the extent that you're going through a process of self-appropriation, you're having to deal with change. And to the extent, I think, that you go through a process of self-appropriation and you deal with change, all of this is a journey dealing with change, which journey I would do a lot of interpretation of through philosophical and theological categories, uh, all of that self-appropriation would lead one to God automatically. Whatever that is, whoever that is, we use this word Trinity, we use that, uh, as Carl Runner says, the only problem with the Trinity is there are neither three gods, um, nor are there, I forget, is, nor are they persons. Other than that, there's no problem with the doctrine of the Trinity. <laughs> there are neither three nor, either there are neither three nor are they persons. So, self-appropriation, just appropriating oneself, which I think there's a lot of links with that in our Carmelite tradition on contemplation, appropriating oneself, and whatever helps you to do that, and as I say in my case, philosophy and theology had a lot to do that, for, uh, to do with that. For me, theology was prayer, and I would tell my students that. Uh, theology is not just a head trip. We're not here for a head trip. You're only going to be examined on what you got in your head. I can't examine you for anything else. But theology is much, much more than a head trip. It's mystagogy. So for me, the journey was very involved with, uh, the journey of self-appropriation was very involved with philosophy and theology. And it led me to, rather than use the word Trinity, it led me to the, to quote Marner, the ineffable, incomprehensible mystery. I've already talked. Yeah, tough question. You can't pass, by the way. Okay. Oh, no, I'm not going to pass. But I've already talked, so I give her a chance. Okay. Now, just briefly, I would I would answer it in a very practical way, uh, the response. And I would say really two things have helped me, you know, this journey of trying to be, you know, with God's grace more open and, um, you know, to, yeah, to be open to the journey, what's, you know, especially the difficult moments, the tough times on the journey. So two things I would say. One is, and it's really what I've learned from Carmel, um, is to learn to create that empty space. You know, that empty space where, um, yeah, where God can do what God will do. <laughs> you know? And, and that helps a lot, you know, I think, uh, in, in this journey of transformation. So not a lot of words, but just being and just creating, being open to that empty space that God wants to give me so that God can do what he wants to do. And then the second thing I think is uh, the support of others. You know, um, as growing on the journey, we really need one another. We need one another and we need, um, yeah, to, to learn from one another. And when I say from one another, I don't mean just you know, the people around of us, around us, but also from the tradition, you know, from the saints who really, really are our friends, you know, on the journey, and really are companions on the journey. And so often, you know, you're reading something in Teresa of Avila, and you say, wow, you know, that really touches my heart and challenges me to grow. And, and that's, you know, part of the journey. So I would say, yeah, first, um, yeah, that empty space, and secondly, the friends on the journey. 
not only uh, the friends in this life, but also the friends who have preceded us. I, I guess I consider myself an extremely lucky person. I've always been, as long as I can remember, a person who, I don't mean this in a lackadaisical way, for whom in, li in my life I'm, I'm along for the ride and I enjoy it. Uh, and you know, just I, mean, I never had to really struggle with that. I don't. I mean, there's a sense in which I'm living. It's not that I don't want a life, a meaningful, purposeful life. It's not you know hedonism or something. But I haven't really cared with being in control. It's in fact, in many ways, I pref much much prefer having things happening around me and being part of something going on. I've always been that way. So that's why I've been very, very lucky in this regard that change has never been a big issue for me. And I, you know, I just, uh, nothing in my, it's just the way I was born, I guess, when my mother dropped me on my head. Um, <laughs> but, and, you know, when I was younger, like even going back to grade school, the areas in which I found that kind of just the flow of the river where I could jump into it was in art, music and poetry especially. And music, you know, you, when you're listening to music, you go with the flow of the music and you let the music happen to you. The same with poetry, either reading it or when you're writing it, you have to let the poetry happen. Poetry cannot be forced. You've got to let the poetry happen to you. So that's where I kind of found it. And then as I matured and grew in my faith, I began to find it in spirituality and in Carmel in the, the regular practice of prayer. So that being a contemplative is crucial to me in allowing this sense of the flow of existence of which and the kind of great fabric of existence of which I am a part, a small part, but a part with infinite significance, uh, that to allow that to catch me up. And so through my practice of contemplative prayer, I have a kind of regular infusion in this, this mystery of which I, I'm a part. And change within that, that there's going to be change, is to be presumed. I mean, if it, there were not change, something would be wrong. And so life is constantly changing, and that's okay with me. I can deal with it. I mean, like most, I'm sorry to take up time, but most recently, you know, our province, we just had our triennial provincial chapter. Our province is not in the greatest shape. Uh, Father Daniel can tell you all about the, diff the things that we are suffering, or uh, suffering, no, the challenges that we are facing in our, our province. And the future of our province may be death. But that's okay with me, you know. I'm committed to my province. I'll do everything I can. I want to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. But if everything I do at the end, it's, you know, turn out the lights and go home, that's okay. That's what I mean. I don't know. It's my personality never. So I'm very, very lucky in this regard. <laughs> oh, don't clap. No, 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 no. I was just. Um, you have to swallow it, I guess. Okay. Um, can, can you hear me? Okay. I realize from what you're saying and how beautifully you speak of God always being greater and His real need to co to create eternally. Um, but I should, well, not but and. I think that's probably a better conjunction. How does sin fit into this? Because we're bumping up um, against not so much one another, because I think that um, as you pray and contemplate, you realize that your oneness and what God is asking you to do is going to be accomplished by him through you, so why worry about it? Just, <laughs> just say yes and do it. you know. But, but sin is something that... Um, 
uh, maybe it's because it's so concretely defined in Leviticus and uh, you know in the first five books and how it's illustrated. Uh, but how does that work out? Where else is this? You got an answer. <laughs> I'm not too sure I even understand the question. Uh, <coughs> how does sin fit into this? This being what? Okay. Right. Um, I have to take this. Okay. This being uh, the presentation of Pope Francis asking us to uh, consider the greatness of God and um, move with uh, the Holy Spirit through our contemplation and acting upon things that will increase our being able to touch other people in our society. And uh, in, in that way, we really make the world smaller by taking away the stereotypes that are there. But, we, but it, is sin is sin consistently the same? Because no one has mentioned that, but I can see by just reading the newspapers how evident um, it is because of the rigidity of how the world is and the unforgiveness of stereotypes. Is no, okay. Now, is your, are you addressing your question to all three of us? Okay, that's just fine. I, I'm just I'm just curious. Yeah. I don't mean to drop a bomb or anything. I'm sorry. It's not a bomb. The, uh, Chris, the theologian in me says the first thing is what do we mean by sin? Uh, I think. Getting away from God. I, th yeah. I think okay. that when you're talking Pope Francis, probably the, uh, the more operable understanding of sin is what? Well today we call social sin or systemic sin. That is sin that's embedded within the milieu, within history, within systems and structures of history. But underlying that sin is personal sin, and underlying that sin is what I call almost, I have to use a technical term here, an ontological understanding of sin. By that I mean this. In the scriptures, sin basically has the meaning of deviation right. or of being short of the mark. Right. Now, what I tell myself constantly... Well, I think it means more selfishness. Yeah. In the scriptures, sin means deviation or being short of the mark. That's the b basic biblical notion of sin. Okay. Being short of the mark or deviation. Now, what I tell myself, and what I teach in a classroom, and what I've said to many people one-to-one -one in confessionals, outside of confessions, I think one of the first things we have to, to deal with in our journey toward God is accepting the fact to quote Pope Francis, I am a sinner, when he was interviewed by Antonio Spadaro, the interview that is in American Magazine that I pointed out this morning. And Spadaro asked him, who is Jorge Bergoglio? And the first thing he says, I am a sinner. Now, when we hear that because of our education, and especially because of the influence of Augustine uh, in spirituality and theology in the Western Church, when we hear the word sin or sinner, oh, that sets off all sorts of negative alarm bells and guilt. Whereas, I think most profoundly, sin and the great Irenaeus, the bishop, second bishop of Lyon, who died around two something, 201 or somewhere in there. Uh, Irenaeus had this understanding of sin as being short of the mark. That's the way we come into the world. So, we come into the world short of the mark. That's why I, that I use the word ontological. It's almost built into our very being. God does not create us in the seventh mansion. That's yet to be achieved. So, so the first thing about sin is I think we have to be realistic and like Jorge uh, Bergoglio say, I am a sinner. Therefore, don't get all bent out of shape when you act like a sinner. Because we're all short of the mark. 
and I do think that, and this is where, again, getting back to Pope Francis, Latin American liberation theology, I think that, especially in the world of Pope Francis, the more operable notion of sin is systemic sin. Sin that's built into systems and structures. Systems and structures and ideologies that enslave people, marginalize people, that's the kind of sin that I think we have to fight against through process, what I was using that term, process. Those are just a few, re a few unrelated reflections. I think. If I can add a few more unrelated reflections, <laughs> I would just add to that and say, I think for Pope Francis, uh, it's not only I am a sinner, but I need God's mercy. And you know, the whole year of mercy was, was all about that, and it still continues now. And I would just say, you know, the way it, it, it comes out for me, and I think this is the way that he sees it, is I'm a sinner. I need God's mercy. I need to acknowledge my sin and acknowledge it regularly. And for him, the sacrament of reconciliation is very, very important. And I do this so that I might be set free so that I can be set free to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. And it's a constant up and down. We're all going through this, but this is the, the pattern of, of the Christian life. I'm a sinner. I need God's mercy. I acknowledge my sin and accept God's mercy, and I'm set free to share the good news with others. Um, I do think, like, Father, Father Don was talking about systemic sin. Uh, if we are intimately be, beyond ways we don't even understand, interdependent, interconnected with each other, that's both through grace, but it's also th through sin. Uh, to give a simple example of that, probably many of you can, can understand, I have one of my brothers, well, both my brothers are engineers, but one is a chemical engineer, and he's worked for, for many, many years at a, for a company. And it's been a trial for them because, as you know, corporations have a particular culture to them. And, and I would say most of the time, if not always, that culture is not particularly gospel. It's not helpful to the person. And what happens then is the people that excel in that system are those who give themselves over to the system and you can see as they move up the ranks how they, they start to think according to the system, they become abusive and derogatory toward others, it fosters aggression and this sort of thing within the system. And the, the only way out is not to live according to the system, which means you've got to, you're going to get fired, you'll get fired. And so my brother is there in this s structure trying to live as a Christian in re his relations with his co-workers. And at one point that he got called into work, the guy sat him down and said, you know, basically I forget what the issues was, but somebody came up and he said, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I can't do that. And he said, okay, you'll never get another raise. So that's systemic sin. And my brother refused to give himself to it. He eventually quit. He, he retired at 55 just to get out of there, you know, save his soul, as it were. Um, but, that, but that sort of stuff is going on all over the world, all the time. And we are victims of it even without our knowing. The way our thinking is structured and shaped, the way we interact with other people, the way our societies are set up. And we don't question, you know, uh, Father Don was talking about the preferential for option for the poor. One of the great meanings of that is if we take the place of the poor, it requires us to step outside the structures, the presumed structures of our society, and look at it from the perspective of those who are sinned against by our society. And therefore, that way we can begin maybe to change it. It's this long, slow process. It takes forever. I mean, this is the coming of the kingdom of God. It will go on forever. Now, on a personal basis, I think that's sort of, yeah, with what Father Don was saying, that sin somehow or another 
is the stuntedness of my existence. You know, as I said, that, you know, we are potentially a universe, you know? And yet, I mean, how, I'm, I'm like a flower trying to grow up in a sidewalk, you know, that gets between the cracks in a sidewalk. And maybe I'll bloom, maybe I won't. This, the stuntedness of life everywhere. You look around us, and life is so promising and so rich and so beautiful, but yet it is also so, in many ways, stunted. It fails the mark. It never lives up to its promise. Uh, it's destructive in many ways. We, life thrives because we feed off of each other, and literally feeding off of things. So this aspect of, of life, which seems so in opposition to God's purposes. I think one thing you can pick up from the New Testament, especially, is that there's so much going on in the world that stands in opposition to God. I mean, you know, we talk about the permissive will of God. I don't know what that means. It's that the, that, that the world somehow or another, in ways we don't understand, is in a fight with God. But it's also in an act of surrender to God. So this is going on, and it won't get resolved till the end of time, and that's okay with me. <laughs> as, as Martin Luther said, uh, as Martin Luther said, we are all simul justus et peccator. We're both just and sinner at the same time, and that's true, and it will always be true. Uh, we're both old Adam and new Adam, and that will always be true. Uh, and there's where I think mercy is so important. Uh, on the personal level, mercy. Uh, you know, again, since Augustine, we've been beating ourselves over the head since 400 with guilt, 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 rather than just accepting the fact that's the way we are. And God can handle that. I just tell my students when I talk theology of grace, <coughs> leave the driving to Greyhound <laughs> and the saving to God, not ourselves. That's Pelagianism. Okay, thank you. I think, uh, do we have, do you have time, maybe one more? Okay, uh, Rita, and then we'll get going. I'll never hear this one. <laughs> I'll never hear it. <laughs> I thought she said I'm like. Oh, Rita, you look great. Yeah. I love. The Trinity on uh, Elizabeth II. Remember that the Trinity is three Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father honors the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the Son loves Mary. And the Spirit is within Mary. And with a beautiful name, a name for Elizabeth, and I congratulate all of you to dissect the name Father is God, Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And this is the lesson of Father Donald. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this is the lesson of Father Donald. Let me try to continue. The negative critic of the traditional theology or the spirituality, which is overly spiritualized. And in what you mentioned something about um, that, that part of the criticism has something to do with the um, saving of the soul but neglect of the body and and it, it and you describe it as the spirituality of invasion rather than spirituality of insertion could you just further explain that please? because I was a little bit um, Okay, he's gonna, he's gonna, my hearing's not good, so he's gonna repeat the question. Okay. She wants you to elaborate a bit on the distinction between the spirituality of evasion and the spirituality of insertion. Okay. 
Yeah, the spirituality of evasion and the spirituality of immersion. You want me to discuss that a little bit for you? Yeah. Yeah, well, basically what Gutierrez is getting at there is the spirituality of evasion, going back to Augustine, is a spirituality which says, let the world take care of the world, and let the uh, state take care of the, the problems of the world. That's not my problem. That's not part of spirituality. Spirituality means going to church, saying rosaries, making novenas, praying, uh, time, on, time in chapel. That's spirituality. Receiving sacraments, that's spirituality. But spirituality has nothing to do with the fact that uh, 22, 22 to 23 million people just in the near future, may lose health care. That has nothing to do with spirituality. That's not a problem for the church. Well, let's the, that's the civil society take care of that. As a disciple of Jesus, I don't have to be immersed or inserted to, into that conflict. No, my job is to go to church and say prayers, say my rosary. Where the brown scapular? That's, uh, ev in other words, evade the world with all of its sinful structures and conflicts, all the injustice that's going on in the world, not my problem. It's, it's Jesus and me, not Jesus and us. And, and the us includes creation, la dato si. It includes everything that's said in la dato si is part of the us. Because we're part of the garden. We're not outside the garden, we are one of the beings in the garden. D does that help? Yeah, evasion, avoidance. Okay. I don't. Okay. I guess my question is: At what point are do you agree with active? Do you agree with active protest? And which is nonviolent, or do you think that as uh, black people and religious, that if it comes to violence, we should participate in our uh, support or um, protesting certain system, the systems in the United States? Are you as is that a question addressed That's to me? A question for all of you. So, are you asking me to what extent? I support violence. Right. I'm all for that. That's. Do you think we should ever cross that line? No. No. Okay. My my answer is though I know that from the perspective of my moral, my moral theologian friends, not that I'm an immoral theologian, but <laughs> I'm, I'm not a moral theologian, but I know from my moral theologians that there are times when uh, violence, violent revolution can be justified, just as there are times when war can be justified. But my, my basic answer to your question is I'm against violence and I'm, I would be against violent protests. That was one of the reasons why the young Father Bergoglio and the young Provincial Bergoglio and the young Bishop Bergoglio, that was one of the reasons why he had some reservation with certain of the liberation theologians because he saw in certain of them a call to violence. Now, I haven't found that in them, but that's a discussion that Pope Francis and I can have down the road someday. But I'm basically against violence. Um, I'm a pacifist, so I would resist anything, even going to war. Uh, I, I, so I'm glad I don't, as a religious, I don't pay taxes. So I don't have to worry about my taxes going to bombing yes. Syrians. Uh, and I mean, I'm just a pacifist in that regard. Now, I do know, like for example, during the Civil Rights Day, that they, the, what would they call the Southern, I forget the name of it, but they, they had, to, the group that Martin Luther King was one of the founders of, they had to train them through a lot to get them to be able to do these kind of protests, like the, sitting at, at lunch counters, where people would be screaming at them and all this sort of thing, and not to react. 
and to be able to absorb the violence and not return it. But that takes training. You know, that you don't do that naturally. I think today, some of the street protests that we have can kind of cross the line because some of the participants are not dedicated or trained in that way, and then the, the police come out, sometimes almost literally with tanks or whatever, police come out and start, you know, hosing them down and everything or whatever, and you get this response of violence that is prompted by the violence of the state. The state usually inis initiates the violence because that's how the state, uh, what should I say, shows itself as state by the capacity to, you know, cause violence and control by violence. It does that. And then the, we, the tendency is to respond in kind. And there might be, there might be times when it is justified. I don't know. But as a pacifist, I would always try and figure out, even if it means like Jesus, just absorb the violence and let it kill you. It's easier for me to sit here and, and say that. But that would be my ideal. You know, Jesus on the cross, absorbing the violence of the state and letting it kill him. I also would be against violence. A, a big fan of mine is, uh, is Dorothy Day, who, who was uh, influenced by, a lot by St. Therese. And, um, you know, I think she's a good example of someone, you know, a laywoman who really, um, you know, protested, protested a lot and got arrested a few times, but who was always nonviolent. So she's my example. Okay, thank you, everybody. I think we really, I know we can go on.